So we're going to get started. And my name is Cassie Skobrak. I'm a reference librarian here at the Westerly Library. And this is our second older adult hour. Um, it's a new program and it really stemmed from some of the conversations that we had with um, a lot of you, a lot of the senior members of our population who were saying that some things that were missing in town um, were social opportunities and also that they wish they had a little bit more information about different resources. Um, so that's what this program came from. We're hoping that eventually we're going to be able to move to an in-person program platform, which I think will be a lot better for everyone. But for now, we are working with what we have. And we are very pleased to have um, Jeff Barker from the Westerly Ambulance Corps with us today. And he's going to start us off today by talking about some of the resources that they provide. So Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jeff Barker. I'm a captain and supervisor at uh, Westerly Ambulance Corps. I'm also one of the paramedics here. Um, I just want to say that I'm thankful for the opportunity to represent the Ambulance Corps and speak to all of you through this forum. I'd also like to thank Cassie and Sue for this opportunity. Um, I hope that you and all your families are doing good, um, are in good health, and, um, and have been doing well during this pandemic. Um, if you're not familiar with the Westerly Ambulance Corps, uh, we've been serving the communities of Westerly and Pawkatuck for uh, well, about since 1917. And we still do that to this day. Um, currently the Ambulance Corps uh, is mainly comprised of paid crew staff as volunteer membership has kind of fallen off over the last several years. So I would suggest if you feel like uh, volunteering and you wanna help out with the community, feel free to stop by the station house. Uh, we do have uh, memberships for uh, uh, seeking out to become uh, volunteers here at the Ambulance Corps, you're more than welcome. Um, I would say, uh, I would kind of lead into with that, um, what we do here, um, the dynamic of what we call EMS or emergency medical services um, has changed significantly over time. Um, the days of being called or recognized as just ambulance drivers is kind of long gone. Um, we no longer just show up or put someone in the back of the ambulance and drive to the hospital. Um, in today's time, EMS utilizes uh, the ambulance as a kind of mobile hospital. Um, emergency medical technicians and paramedics can perform life-saving interventions while we're in the back of the ambulance or even in your home. Um, some of these interventions we can do are like administering medications, obtaining echocardiograms of the heart, uh, starting intravenous access where we put a, a needle into your vein so we can go ahead and um, access that in terms of giving fa uh, medications faster. Um, we also have the ability to do all, um, the ability, I should say, to do all of this aids in, uh, aids most of us uh, EMTs and paramedics in determining uh, what is going on with you or a family member. Um, and that's important because um, we do this uh, to properly treat somebody and identify um, what is going on with the person. And that also helps us treat the patient, you know, somebody or a patient. Um, it also lets us determine which hospital is the appropriate hospital for someone. Um, I would uh, further break this down and say that the need to identify the appropriate hospital in today's time is extremely important. Um, it's based on a couple of factors. Um, the first factor is that EMTs and paramedics operate off of a set, uh, set of state protocols. They're guidelines that basically tell us what we can and cannot do. Um, for lack of a better term, it's essentially our Bible. Um, these protocols dictate what we can or cannot do in the back of the ambulance, and they're set forth by the Rhode Island Department of Health or the Connecticut Department of Health. Um, if we deviate from these, there can be some serious repercussions for us as providers. Um, you know, as far as us possibly even lo uh, losing our licenses. Um, the second factor um, in determining the appropriate hospital for a patient is this is accomplished through detailed assessments of a patient. An example of this would be identifying that someone uh, was having a heart attack. Uh, the proper hospital for someone having this type of issue would be a hospital that is designated as what we call a PCI center is that they can do an intervention uh, to relieve a blockage within the heart uh, and correct that problem. Um, a lot of people are surprised when we tell them that we're going to Lawrence Memorial Hospital or Kent Hospital um, or even Rhode Island Hospital because they're having a heart attack. 
you know, this, this often prompts, you know, uh, family members or even the patient to ask, why aren't we just going to Westerly Hospital? Um, this is because, you know, a lot of people don't realize that the Westerly Hospital is not what we call that PCI center. Um, and um, they just can't provide the care that you needed, uh, that's needed for somebody that's having a heart attack. Um, and that ultimately this, you know, results in us having to explain this um, to the patient or the family members. Um, another example uh, would be someone involved in a severe motor vehicle crash and has extensive injuries. Uh, the proper facility for somebody like that will be a level one trauma center. Uh, Westerly Hospital is designated as a level three trauma center, uh, while Rhode Island Hospital is designated as a level one trauma center. So uh, I'm sure you can guess where we would go at that point. Um, the importance of being able to take a patient to the appropriate facility is paramount. Um, we look at it this way in the field is time equals tissue. So when you're having a heart attack, you have a blockage in the heart, it's causing heart muscle to die for all time. That's basic, simple, it's the truth. Same thing when you have a stroke, if you have a blockage in, in your brain in one of your arteries that feeds the oxygen to your brain, well, brain tissue starts to die um, if you don't re, what we call reprofuse those areas. And that's why it's important um, to take the patient to the proper uh, facility because time is of the essence. We always say time is tissue. So the faster we can identify something going on with somebody and the need for them to go to the appropriate facility, the faster we can get them in so the interventions that the hospital can do can reperfuse those areas that are, that are not getting the oxygenated blood that they need and are, is causing damage to someone. Um, because identifying what is going on with a patient and determining the appropriate hospital is uh, so important, we may end up spending a few minutes in the ambulance performing these assessments or interventions, you know, that I talked about earlier, uh, before we even begin transporting to the hospital. Um, so a lot of people always ask, oh, what, what's taking so long? Why aren't, you know, why aren't we moving yet? Well, there's a few things that we can do in the back of the ambulance that helps someone um, in terms of, it can aid in alleviating most of the, you know, some of those issues. But ultimately, yes, you need to get to the hospital so you can get what we call definitive care. Um, but the, the things that we do in the back of the ambulance um, prevent things from getting worse. Um, it can help maintain you until we can get to the hospital in, in those interventions. Um, so, um, this goes back to what I started with earlier. Um, we're no longer just ambulance drivers. Um, you have to remember that we are actually licensed and trained professionals, um, that we have your best interest in the, and well being in mind. Um, we, prov uh, we pride ourselves on delivering the best patient care possible to you or your family member when, we call, when we're called. Um, I would like to remind everyone that the Westerly Ambulance Corps offers subscriptions, memberships to Westerly residents. Uh, the subscription is about $60 a year. Um, this membership entitles you to emergency, non-emergency ambulance transport to any hospital within 75 miles of Westerly. When requested by police, physicians, or uh, appropriate 911 calls. Um, and also when service is provided by the Westerly uh, Ambulance Corps, service must originate in Westerly. It's got to start in Westerly. Um, just so everybody knows, we will still bill your insurance, but any remaining balance is, is waived when you have your membership. Um, some important information that goes along with that. Um, the program is uh, for only residents of Westerly. Unfortunately, we do not offer the services for Quokotec residents. As the state of Connecticut, it doesn't allow us to do that. Um, it's quite unfortunate. Um, love to be able to provide that for the Quokotec residents, but unfortunately, it's not something that we can do. Um, moving on um, for non-emergency transports, like if you were to go from the hospital to your home or from the hospital to a nursing facility, um, essentially they have to be medically um, necessary by, you know, deemed medically necessary by a physician or a doctor. Um, they have to be scheduled in advance. Um, they are subject to the availability of what we have available for personnel and equipment. Um, elective procedures like going to the doctor, your doctor's office visits, or ongoing treatments like dialysis or chemotherapy, radiation therapy, they're, they're not included, unfortunately. 
we're working on that. We may be changing that sometime in the near future, but as of right now, that's, uh, that's how it stands. Um, the subscriptions start March 1st of every year and extends for one year. Um, at contributions, if you decide to uh, come on board uh, after March 1st, there's a 30 day waiting period and it, unfortunately it's not prorated. Um, renewal forms will be mailed out uh, to you right after the holidays, um, usually in January. Um, it will be the renewal forms is when they usually go out. Um, Again, if you're interested in obtaining a subscription, uh, we have them in the front lobby of our station house located at 30 Chestnut Street in Westerly. We also have them available on our website at www.westerlyambulance.org. Um, I also know that in our lobby, as well as on the website, we have the applications to become a volunteer and volunteer your time here with the Westerly Ambulance. Um, currently, in terms of COVID, I would recommend that everybody continues to follow anything that's put out by the Department of Health for each of your states respectively and any CDC guidelines. Um, currently, we are assisting the town and the police department with um, COVID vaccination administrations and um, they are at, uh, we've been conducting them at the Westerly Senior Center. Um, again, if you have any questions regarding COVID and um, signing up for those uh, inoculations, uh, I would recommend visiting the uh, Department of Health's website as they've uh, been stating all along. Um, and again, uh, we'd be uh, more than happy to see you uh, down here at the Ambulance Corps if you were interested in volunteering your time. Um, we'd be happy to see you if you were interested in getting a subscription. And uh, I'll open it up for any questions that anybody may have. I do have several questions. Okay. <laughs> First of all, Jeff, let me introduce myself. I'm Sue Ogle and I'm, I'm wearing three hats, I guess. <laughs> uh, I, I happen to be uh, the board chair of the board of the Westerly Library as well as Wilcox Park. So um, that's my full-time volunteer job. And then uh, my second hat is um, there's a new group being formed, which Cassie knows about, called Westerly Village. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, I'll just mention it in a minute, but I am on the steering committee for that. And then um, I fit the description of uh, uh, an older adult. So those are my three hats. <laughs> so, um, are you familiar, Jeff, with the Westerly Village concept? Um, I am not, but I am certainly um, intrigued by it because um, we offer a community paramedicine program. Um, we started doing it pre-COVID. Yeah. Um, and that, um, once COVID hit, it kind of fell by the wayside. But initially, it was us visiting um, like uh, the Westerly Senior Center as well as... Um, Babcock Village um, and um, the uh, Dixon Street apartment complex. Uh, and essentially what we would do is um, we'd come in, we'd talk to um, the residents, we'd get their information, we'd get their medication list, go through that with them if they had any questions. We would do our, you know, we would answer them for, uh, answer that for them. Um, if it was something that was kind of beyond us, we would recommend, you know, that they needed to talk to their primary care doctor. Uh, we would take a uh, set of vital signs and make sure that they were in pretty good health. If they had any complaints or anything or things that are concerns that they might need to go over with their primary care, or if it's something that we could help them with. But essentially what it boiled down to was we were creating a database uh, to see, you know, where, uh, where the population lies and um, in case we ever had a contact with them and they weren't able to convey to us what you know, their medical history is or what medications they take. It would all be in our database already. So if we ended up having that, you know, contact with someone, we would, we would have a pretty good idea of, you know, what we would be dealing with. Um, so that in that respect, the community paramedicine program might be a good thing to bring on board with what you're talking about. I think it's a perfect match. Um, so let me just give you a, a, a big picture of Westerly Village. This is a brand new concept for Westerly. It, it's actually a, a national organization and they were formed um, 
probably 20 to 25 years ago. There are over 200 in the US. There are three in Rhode Island, one okay. in Barrington, one in Providence, and one in the Cranston area. It's a nonprofit organization focusing on mutual support for older adults by involving the greater community as volunteers. So it's really older adults helping each other to stay in their home, to stay healthy, uh, to stay integrated into their communities. Um, so what we're doing is because of a couple of surveys that were done in the last two years, there was a definite need in the greater westerly area. So it was, Cassie, and correct me on this, it was really the age-friendly group that, that initiated yeah, concept. like you said, you're correct in that we we started doing the community conversations and I, like every single meeting it was mentioned that essentially community of mutual support is something that people were interested in. Um, and just getting those services or help with things that they can't necessarily, aren't easy to get elsewhere or that you'd have to maybe pay more than you're able for. Um, things like transportation, handyman services, that sort of thing. So the discussion really started, I would say, late fall, Jeff. Okay. And um, starting in January, it became more serious. <laughs> uh, we do have a mentor that we're working with in uh, Westerly from the Providence Village. And there is a 501c3 that's called um, Rhode Island Common. I'm not sure I've got that right. Village Common, yep. Village Common thank you. Okay. And yeah. so that I kind of say that's our mothership because they've got the 501c3, they have a paid executive director, they have a part-time um, coordinator so right. that the three villages, we would be number four if we do move forward, but it certainly looks like we are. Um, but pulling it back to why we're here today, um, I have my sheet in front of me, Jeff, on some of the things that we're thinking about offering, um, rides for members, handling household chores, providing technology, um, consultation on home safety, and uh, regular calls and visits with members, um, running errands, planning health and wellness programs, uh -huh. <laughs> which is very relevant, uh, providing yes. uh, social, educational, cultural activities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this whole idea of, you know, you called a community care program would be perfect for this um, because one of the services eventually we would like to offer is healthcare education. Absolutely. We, you know, we're not a referral organization to healthcare, um, like if you're sick, you know, which of the nursing homes should you go to? That's not our purpose. Um, it's really providing information on where, you know, what are all the nursing homes, et cetera, but it's not um, providing health care. Right. So I see yeah. that as a wonderful link for what you're talking about. Absolutely. And you, you could almost take that a step further because you'd be surprised the people that um, I come across that don't, don't even have like a primary care doctor. Yeah. So if you're if if we happen to through the process here, if we happen to come across you know some of these individuals that don't have a primary care physician, you know we can you know strongly recommend that they do obtain one. Um, you know because everybody's health and well-being is paramount. So um, so th that was just one comment in terms of how we could partner together. But you used a terminology that I didn't know what it was, a PCI center? Yes. Yep. A PCI center is, um, it's, it's rather interesting. Um, what they do is they're, um, it's a precutaneous, um, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of it. That's <laughs> all right. I uh, it's, it's, it's a long. <laughs> okay. 
Um, uh, actually, hold on. I'll get the answer for you. I got it here somewhere. <laughs> Percutaneous coronary intervention? Yes. Yeah. Coronary <laughs> intervention. That is it exactly. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks, Cassie. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, we refer to it just as PCI so often that a lot of us just forget the actual like lengthy name of it. But yes, um, what they're looking to do is with that particular um, intervention, like I described before, um, your heart has a bunch of uh, vessels that are around it. Um, there's veins and then there's arteries that feed the heart with oxygenated blood. Heart is the first organ that actually gets oxygenated blood. Um, and it's very interesting because we, we call it that the heart is greedy. It is the most greedy organ out of any of them. Um, it always, it wants that oxygenated blood. So what happens is um, over the years, based on your diet, um, it could be uh, genetic as well. You eventually, we all get it, uh, cholesterol, and then we get the plaque buildup in, in the walls of the artery. So if your artery is this big when you start off at birth, well, we get a little bit of plaque buildup. Now it becomes this for an opening. So it makes it a little more difficult for blood to get through, correct? Well, depending upon what's going on with us, whether we're running, exercising, sitting, your heart, you know, your, your vessels do this. You know, they, they, they fluctuate, they, they dilate, and then, you know, they constrict based on what we're doing. Um, essentially what happens is um, a plaque buildup in here can either break free and then it causes the body to do its normal response thinking that the blood vessel is broken. So when a blood vessel breaks open or you get a cut, you start coagulating um, to go ahead and stop that bleeding. Well, the coagulation um, entities just go ahead and completely seal that up without even realizing they're doing it. And what it does is it cuts off blood flow to certain portions of the heart. That's when you start having the chest pain, the shortness of breath, because your heart's not getting the oxygen, so it's making you breathe more, and you feel like you can't get enough oxygen. The chest pain has to do with the, the pain receptors of that heart tissue that's not getting that oxygen, and the tissue is actually starting to die. Um, it becomes ox oxygen starved, and then it can only last for so long before, before that area of the heart tissue starts to Die. So what we do is when we go in there, we recognize that someone ha is having this, whether uh, by determining it, we use an EKG. Uh, by looking at the EKG and reading the EKG, we can tell exactly what part of the heart's affected, um, what's going on, whether they're actually, you know, having what we call an uh, ST elevated myocardial infarction. Infarction means death of tissue. Myocardial is heart. So I know I'm getting into the technical terms of it, but um, not to bore anybody or confuse anybody. What we do is we give um, an anticoagulant or an antiplatelet, which is the most simple medicine possible. It's aspirin. Um, anytime you're having like a chest pain and you're having difficulty breathing and you get pale and all sweaty, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily mean you're having a heart attack, but it doesn't hurt to just pop an 81 milligram baby aspirin. Um, and then what happens is it lubricates, like I said, the, the blood cells in, in your artery and it allows, instead of clotting, it allows, uh, it's like spraying those blood vessels with silicone so that they can pass through. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, another thing that we can do is um, offer some pain management medications. And those pain management medications, um, if your blood vessels all constricted and you got that blockage there, what can happen is we can open it up a little bit by giving some of the pain medication, allows some of the blood to go through. And then what we can do is we can make it even bigger by giving a nitroglycerin because a nitroglycerin is a very, very strong, um, what we call vasodilator. So it's going to dilate that blood vessel even further to let more oxygen pass through. Um, and that's why we do a lot of the things. That's why it takes us a little bit longer sometimes in the ambulance before we get rolling and we go to a facility. But once we've identified all these things and we've done our interventions that we can do pre hospitally or before we go to the hospital, once we identify, you know, we do our interventions, we know that we have to go to one of these PCI centers. What they do is once we get there, they bring the patient right in, put them on a table. They put what they call a sheath. And usually they go right through this artery right here in your wrist. And then once they place the sheath, they go in with what we used to always call the angioplasty. It's a balloon. And what they do is they, they go in, they shoot dye into the bloodstream 
once they get close to the heart with the catheter, they'll see where the blockage is. They'll go in with the balloon, they'll open it up, close it, open it up, and they'll try and figure out what's going on with it. And they'll inject more dye into it while they're doing that. And then once, once they've got a pretty good idea of where and, um, and what sections of that blood vessel are having the issue where it's like completely occluded and nothing can get through, you know, you're not getting that oxygenated blood. Sort of reoxygenate it. That's why we call it reperfusion. It means you're getting it open back up and you're getting it reperfused to, to stop any more dying tissue or any tissues from dying. So once they do that, they'll go ahead and balloon it up again. And then what they do is they put a stent in. And a cardiac stent is a, it's usually um, a very strong material. It could be um, metal, it could be um, non-metal, but it's like a mesh. And what it does is when they insert it, it expands out and holds open that blood vessel. Um, you'll nine times out of 10 and for 15, 20 years down the road, you'll never have a problem with that specific area of the heart because of those, because, because of where they place that. Now, it's not to say that later on, you know, in a different spot or a different area, you may, you know, you could end up having the same problem and they'll have to go in again and, you know, reperfuse those areas. But what it boils down to is that, you know, they, they place those, it reperfuses it. Um, and that's the, that's the goal of bringing somebody to um, a facility like that is so that, Essentially, they completely correct the heart attack at that point, as, as everybody calls it a heart attack. We call it, an, in, in our, in our uh, terms, we always say it's a STEMI or ST elevated myocardial infarct. So we, that's, that's, that's the acronym that we use. You know, we'll, we'll say, I've had identi we'll look at our partner in the back of the ambulance. Yeah, it's a STEMI. And then we'll be like, okay, well, we know where we need to go. We need to do a couple of things and then we need to get moving. Um, <clears throat> so that's how that works. And then, like I said, in the other aspect, I kind of went over with what they do at the hospital. And the interesting thing about some of those um, uh, caths that, or the um, stents that they put in place, some of them are what they call drug eluding. And what they'll do is that it eludes a drug that essentially keeps um, that particular area as well and surrounding area around it from building up those plaque or um, getting um, the blood coagulating in that particular area or plaque buildup. So that way, if something were to happen, it would just pass through that area and you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't have the same issue again. Um, so it's interesting to see. Um, I've watched a couple of the procedures when I brought somebody into the hospital, into a PCI center. There's a lot of the docs are really good about that. They'll say, hey, do you wanna watch this? You know, see how it goes and you wanna see, you know, watch me reperfuse this area and it's it's interesting because you'll see the way the blood vessel goes and wraps around the heart and then when they inject that dye it gets to a certain point and stops but you can see where the rest of the the, the artery is supposed to go and where it's supposed to go but there's a blockage there and th then when they go in with their balloon they blow it up and they inject the dye and it goes right past and you're like okay so that's that's the area they need to reperfuse that and that's where they're going to put the stent so then they back back they back it out and then they get the stent opens it up and then they put the stent in and as soon as they release it the stent pops open like this and holds the walls open of that artery and, and they inject the dye just to make sure and it, it's it's amazing just to see that happen i'll take your word for it <laughs> so you mentioned that westerly hospital is not a pci center but uh rhode island hospital and um lawrence memorial correct and even kent hospital in warwick is Okay, Kent is too. Yep. Um, Westerly Hospital, in terms of strokes, on the other flip side, not just for the heart issues, um, Westerly Hospital is a stroke ready uh, hospital, which means they can handle it. They can go ahead and do some uh, limited interventions for somebody having a stroke. And then they can go ahead and transfer that patient to what we call uh, a definitive stroke center or a comprehensive stroke center is the correct term. Um, very similar. We call, the, we call those facilities like Western Hospital an outlying stroke center. South County is an outlying stroke center. Um, technically, Lawrence Memorial is an outlying stroke center, depending upon the time of day, because they don't always have neuro on uh, um, working, um, I believe, through the night. Uh, neuro is the department that essentially handles strokes. 
Yeah. Um, the only real true comprehensive stroke center we have is Rhode Island Hospital for the city. Mm -hmm. um, a comprehensive stroke is a uh, center is required for somebody that's having a massive bleed, um, massive head bleed. In other words, it's similar to where, or it's not similar, but essentially um, due to the plaque buildup or another reason, maybe a trauma, um, one of the blood vessels in the head um, is now leaking blood into the brain area. And by doing so, it's creating so much pressure that um, normal, normal functions like the facial droop, um, one eye uh, pupil being bigger than the other one, um, you know, losing motor function on one side of the body. That's what's created by that. Um, and based on the severity, um, we don't necessarily have to go to an outlying stroke center. Um, there's a score that we give people when they're, when they're having a stroke based on what our findings are. Yeah. Um, if that score is a four or more, we, by pr our protocols, which I talked about earlier, um, we have to transport to Rhode Island Hospital. We cannot go to an outlying stroke center. So that's that's goes back to what I was talking about earlier with taking somebody to the appropriate facility. So, um, but like I said, Westerly Hospital is capable of handling that. Um, we make that determination in the back of the ambulance based on um, how the patient's presenting, what their what their score is um, on the stroke scale, and then we go from there. Um, but um, because some people may not be having that bleed, it may just be a blood clot that went up here and it's just kind of like occluding that area similar to what happens in a heart attack. So that blood vessel is not letting the bl oxygenated blood get through to that part of the brain. Um, so if that, in that case, you know, Westerly Hospital can take care of that. Um, and we'd be able to tell that by, you know, the, uh, by running the stroke scale on somebody. And for them, it would be them administering something um, like an antiplatelet or anticoagulant medication. Um, that would break down that clot and dissolve it and that way it would allow that blood to get back to that area and by that time most of the stroke symptoms should resolve at that point. But like I said, uh, Westerly Hospital is an outlying stroke center, South County is, um, Lawrence Memorial is uh, a toss up between being a comprehensive stroke center as well as an outlying and then Rhode Island is your, is your comprehensive stroke center, mm -hmm. without question. So I have, I have another question on the subscription. Sure. I, I am a Westerly resident. I honestly don't remember. You said something is sent to homeowners? Yes, if you have a previous membership um, from the year before, um, in our database for the memberships and subscriptions, um, you will, uh, every year annually, um, we generate the report um, and we, um, the, uh, the database that we use, we print everybody's um, renewals for their subscription. Now, usually we usually start that process right after the holidays. And those memberships renewals should be out the door no later than the end of January, beginning of February. So it gives everybody like a month to go ahead and uh, renew their subscriptions. Okay, I honestly don't know if I've ever subscribed. Okay. Like I said, um, the best way to do that is one of two ways. Um, you can always come down to the building here. We have uh, an abundance of applications for those subscriptions right in our lobby. Um, and the other way is to go on our website at www.westerlyambulance.org. Yep. Um, you can print okay. them from there and then mail them in and uh, get the ball rolling on, uh, on getting your subscription to the ambulance. And how would I find out if I am a member? I don't think I am because I don't. Um, you could call here um, and then somebody will go ahead and look it up. And then uh, if they can't do it right away, um, they'll, you know, they may say, hey, you know what? Um, give me till the end of the business day and I'll get back to you. Or right. I will find out and uh, you should hear from me by tomorrow. Um, that's essentially how that, uh, that would go. Um, me personally, I should have access to it, but I don't. <laughs> Um, but, um, there's a, I do have a couple of counterparts that work in the office here with me. Yeah. Um, yeah. and they do have access to that. They can look it up. So what I usually do is if I get somebody that calls asking about that, I just go ahead and forward the message along to them. So my last question, going back to the community care program, I don't want to take the time here, uh, but another time who for Westerly Village, 
who would mm -hmm. be the right person to contact to find out more about that? Uh, the community paramedicine program? Um, yes, that would be me. Okay, <laughs> you call it a community care program? It's a community paramedicine program. Care medicine, okay. Um, it falls under, there's a, a federal, um, it's not a federal mandate, but it's a, it's, it's a national program that's moving forward. And the actual acronym is MIH. Um, it's for called Mobile Integrated Health. Um, but the program in Rhode Island, yes, it's called MIH, but they also call it the um, uh, Community Paramedicine Program. So they, they're both the same. They fall under the same umbrella. So for Westerly Village, what would the best name be? Um, I would go with the easiest one is uh, community paramedicine. That's the easiest one, I think, for everybody to okay. remember. So community paramedic care program. Yep, that'll work. All right. Wow. All right. I have one more question, too, for you. Um, if Do you mind just talking briefly about the medical alert cards? Jeff? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, funny you should mention that. Um, we do carry them in our ambulances. Um, we also um, have them in our foyer here at the ambulance court. Um, oh and essentially, I wish I had one up here, but I don't. Um, it's a card, probably about this big, um, and they're orange in color. And what you do is you put your name, date of birth on there, um, what your medical conditions are, uh, your address, uh, goes on there as well. And then in, in addition to your medical conditions, it gives us, uh, you put your medications down that you take daily. And then at the very end, you'll put what medications you're allergic to. So in the event that I come into your house, say you lived alone and I came into your house and you were having a stroke and you weren't able to tell me what's going on with you or what medications you take or what your history is or what your allergies are. I don't want to give you a medication that you're allergic to, obviously. <laughs> so um, by you filling that form out and posting it right on your refrigerator, it's bright orange, it gets my attention and says, oh, look, get the medication list over here and uh, you know, past medical history. Let me go ahead and grab that off the refrigerator. I can look at it. Um, you know, We can continue to do our assessments on you, get you loaded up into the ambulance. And then I have that wonderful little card that tells me everything I need to know about you without you being able to voice it to me. Um, so in the event that you're what we call incapacitated or not able to communicate to us, that little orange card is amazing. And going back to the community paramedicine thing, when um, myself and a couple of others uh, were going around pre-COVID to um, some of the facilities in town here, we were actually handing those cards out and helping community members fill that card out and letting them know, hey, post this on your refrigerator. That way, in the event we come over, we have to pop in. You know, it's right there. You know, and, and you know, God forbid that you're not able to go ahead and can talk to us, communicate with us. We can actually look at that and say, okay, well, we know what's going on. Oh, you had, you know, look at it. Oh, you had a stroke a year ago. Well, you're having, you know, you could be having another stroke now. So that kind of helps us down the road to see, okay, well, what kind of med you know, medical history you have. The other thing too is like, uh, you know, somebody who's unconscious, but before that they had called 911 and they were complaining of severe chest pain and difficulty breathing. That's usually one of your things for a heart attack. But by the time we get there, they're passed out and they can't talk to us. I'm gonna look at their medications and their past medical and it's gonna say high blood pressure. And I'm gonna look for the high blood pressure medication. Then I'm gonna look for the cholesterol medication that's usually associated with that. And I'm gonna be like, okay, this person has cholesterol issues. They have high blood pressure. These are all pre-existing conditions that can eventually lead to a heart attack or something of that nature. So let's go ahead and get a 12 lead EKG and find out if that is the case, what's going on with this person. Nine times out of 10, that's usually what's happening. So, so they really do give a lot of valuable information. Oh, absolutely. I, as a matter of fact, if you gave me a, like, uh, I've had people that couldn't tell me what their medical history was, but they were able to show me the medications they take. And I'm like, okay, well, this one's for cholesterol. Okay, well, this one's for diabetes. Oh, well, this one's for um, uh, high blood pressure. And oh, this one's uh, for depression. Uh, you, I, 
up here by doing it so many times and having a repetition, I can look at a medication to tell you exactly what's going on. I don't even need the, uh, I don't even need you to tell me, oh yeah, I have anxiety or I have high blood pressure. I can look at your medications and be like, okay, well, you've got high blood pressure and you have anxiety and whatever. So it's rather interesting. I know a friend of mine that's in uh, Middletown and okay. they have a system it's through their police and I, I don't remember the name of it but it's a national organization and they have a brick on their front uh, mat uh -huh. and the brick designates to the emergency person where to look in the house for that you, you know that medical information are you familiar with that one no i've never heard of that one that's that's okay. a new one on me Okay. And I think they they keep things in their freezer. Uh, oh. There's a producer some research container and they put everything in their I don't know. Anyway, I've heard of the container in the freezer. And I don't <laughs> remember what people are supposed to put in that container. Um, okay. but I've heard that um, when I first started out early in my in my EMS career, um, I, I I had heard of that. Um, I haven't heard of that if probably in a good six years, seven years, probably the last seven years ago was probably the last time I heard any mention of that. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it depends. Some communities do that and some communities don't. Um, each community is different. It, they, they, do, they implement yeah. different things to protect or safeguard their, you know, uh, members of that community. Yeah, so, um, I guess moral of the story is in Westerly, maybe don't put it in your freezer, but <laughs> take one of these handy medical alert. Yes, the easiest thing is yes, the handy medical alert. Just like I said, you stick that on your fridge, hang it from your fridge or in the vicinity of it. And I walk in, I'm like, oh, I need that. Grab that right off the fridge and then, you know, keep right on doing what we need to do.